today um, for our webinar on Ethiopia. So it's, uh, we've titled it A Cry at Origin. If you're wondering why it is that we're titling that, it's because there's an ongoing conflict right now occurring in Ethiopia that I hope today's uh, webinar is going to help us unpack a bit and have a conversation surrounding that. First and foremost, my name is Gaina Davila. I'm the co-founder of Davila Cafe Coffee Company. My husband, David Davila, and I started the company while we were living in South Asia together. Um, after seeing a need for greater, for greater representation in the coffee industry. Um, at the time, I didn't know that, ooh, excuse me, I'm, at the time, um, we didn't know that there were others who were, um, you know, working in the space, trying to tell a different narrative, trying to um, really show that coffee is, is, is more than just, I guess, perhaps Western consumption. Um, and so I've been really, really fortunate to have the opportunity along with our team to get the chance to tell a different story about coffee. Um, primarily focusing on Haiti and Nicaragua, but we also do, um, we also do have other coffee offerings. And so since Women's History Month is with us today, Women's History Future Month is, is with us, we wanted to take a moment to really highlight how what happens at Origin actually um, affects the industry overall. What's happening to women and girls at Origin can in fact, even if it's a long-term impact, have an impact on our industry. And so here we are today with three incredible panelists. And so what I'm going to do is actually introduce our moderator, who is our chief experience officer. All right, so here we go. I'm going to actually go through the slides and hopefully you're all able to see the slides. Um, and if you're wondering, we, we wanted to make sure that there was a map of Africa also highlighting Ethiopia, of course. Um, I know that sometimes just visuals are helpful. And so if you, if you, I should note that this webinar is created um, in mind that there are folks who will be joining us today who literally have no idea what's happening on the ground. And there are also folks who are expert matters on what's happening. And so I'm going to ask um, that we be very much willing to extend um, grace and patience and allowing our panelists to really unpack certain things, perhaps not so much in an academic manner, although obviously they're welcome to go there, but um, just so that this information is accessible to everyone and so that people can feel like, you know, whether they walked in and heard about this for the very first time today, or they've been sitting and, and, and working on this topic as experts that they have something they can walk away with um, by the end of the webinar. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue with the slides. It's not cooperating. Oh, here we go. All right, so this is a closer, look at Ethiopia. Um, so you have Tigray up there. I'm not going to go through all of it because I know that our panelists are gonna go through it, but I just wanted to make sure that our audience has a chance to, to, to connect with it and see it visually. And here we are with our chief experience officer, Ms. Kathy Latore. Uh, so Kathy will be actually moderating the event today, moderating, excuse me, she'll be moderating the event today. Um, I'm going to read Kathy's bio for you all so that you can have an idea of where she's coming from. Uh, Kathy was born and raised in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and left for Washington DC to attend university, setting roots in the area as she established her career. Uh, Kathleen has been in the events and marketing industry for over 10 years, over a decade, elevating programs and managing the fine details of events of all sizes for national nonprofits and international corporations alike. Her mission-driven work combined with her love for coffee led her to join the Davila Cafe team as the chief experience officer where she curates experiences for the coffee noob and snob alike to learn more about what's in their cup by connecting to its origins and to one another in community with events such as today's webinar. So I have to say personally, um, after having worked with Kat now for a year, um, she's just been such an incredible part of our team. And so Kat, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you so much for leading this conversation. And most importantly, 
thank you very much for being an incredible chief experience officer. Um, you bring so much life and, and detail and intentionality to what we do at Dabla Cafe. So thank you. And with that, I am looking forward to learning so much from this conversation. Ladies, I thank you. I thank you for sharing your stories. Your voices matter. What you know matter, what you've experienced. And, and the causes for which you are fighting, they matter. And we want you to know that at Dabla Cafe, we're tracking um, and we're going to do our very best to stand with you. All right. With that, I am going to pass the mic to Kathy. Hello, good morning. I know we won't necessarily be able to hear from the audience directly, but I still do that. I, if anyone saw um, Marsha Fudge at the White House, she definitely wanted to hear back from everybody else as well. And I, I know that exact feeling. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, the first panelist that I want to introduce today is Ayantu Abdu Salam. She is the development director of Ola. Ayantu is an Oromo American born in Ethiopia who immigrated to the US with her family at the age of 10. She is the current president and development director of Oromo Legacy Leadership and Advocacy Association, also known as OLA, in charge of technical and development programs management for the nonprofit. Ayantu holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering from Purdue University and is passionate about nature, technology, and entrepreneurship. One of her missions in life is to motivate young professionals in the Oromo diaspora to rediscover and connect to their heritage as well as people. Thank you for joining us, Ayantu. Thank you for having me. Of course. Up next, we have Bisrat Gabre Mikael. She is the marketing and branding lead of Omna Tigray. As a proud Tigrayan mobilizer and creator, Bisrat leads marketing and branding for Omna Tigray an advocacy platform founded by a collective of global Tigrayans in response to the war waged on the Tigrayan people on November 4th, 2020. Bisrat is a graduate of Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business and works with technology supporting creators of apps and games. Thank you for joining us, Bisrat. Thank you, and thank you for dedicating time for this uh, conversation. Of course. And our final panelist is Maza Gide. Maza is an international relations researcher, human rights advocate, and a representative of Omna Tigray, a nonpartisan global organization that advocates for Tigrayans and other marginalized people. She is also the co-founder of the Yihono movement, the first independent women's rights movement in Tigray. Maza completed her undergraduate degree in South Korea, where she earned her BA in International Studies on a merit-based scholarship and graduated with honors. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us this morning. Thank you for creating the platform. Of course. And I do want to uh, just make sure that I'm being respectful and honoring everyone that's with us today. Please do not vilify me for my incorrect pronunciations. I'm working very hard on them, as the ladies can attest, um, going over and over. But obviously, I can I can make mistakes too. So I do appreciate your grace um, and understanding as we go throughout the conversation. And please feel free to correct me. I will never learn. So I just want to um, make sure that we say that at the top. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Gaina so eloquently shared, uh, what we want to do is make sure that people who know what's going on in Ethiopia, as well as people who have no idea what's going on, um, can come together today and have a shared conversation that really highlights what's happening on the ground, um, what we can do about it, and next steps. So I'm happy to sh go through this and I want everyone to share their experiences and their perspectives, um, whether they've seen direct action um, or they know things with their family or it's more on the academic side. We wanna make sure that everyone's perspective and voices are heard today. So thank you again. So I will go ahead and start with Ayantu. And this question will go to everyone. I'll just start with each person and I'll go in alphabetical order. So Yantu, could you describe what's happening in Ethiopia right now in one word and tell us why? Okay, thank you for having me. 
Um, so the one word, I've been thinking about it a lot uh, once we got this question. And I think um, since I'm reading the book, um, Atomic Habits, I think the word is atomic in the sense that the little things that are currently happening in Ethiopia are gonna have drastic effects on every single person. Um, of course, in Tigray, I mean, it, it's very direct. You can see what's going on. Um, in the Oromia region, which is in the heartland of um, Ethiopia, what I would call it is more of a, you know, a generational genocide because it's been happening for like 200 years. It's just ongoing. It's one person dies over here, another person dies over here due to um, extra judicial killings. And those little things are adding up. Um, we have, you know, from mental issues like uh, mental health, these people are seeing people die on the sides of the street, just being dumped. What kind of impact does that have? We don't see it. But I think long term, it has a huge effect. And I think we're going backwards. And um, it's a very sad time. I don't know if you want me to expand more on that. But that's my one word for you. No, thank you so much. And we will definitely go into more detail throughout the rest of the conversation. So I do appreciate you starting us off um, with that fantastic description. And so up next, Bisrat, uh, the same question. May you please describe what's happening in Ethiopia right now in one word and tell us why you chose that word. Yeah, so um, I've been thinking about this as well. And in prediction of what Maaz is going to say, I'm going to choose a different word. Uh, and I, I think that for me, it's mostly traumatic. Um, I think that's the word that I would use. I think um, you see that there's a lot of people that are fleeing from their homes. They're leaving everything behind. Um, they're going on foot to Sudan, like fleeing to Sudan. Um, and you also see that there's like many pregnant women who are uh, giving birth during this time as well. And so they're either like giving birth in route or they're giving birth at the refugee camps. Um, there's a lot of hundreds, there's hundreds of children that are unaccompanied as well as at these refugee camps. And you see, you know, to Yanta's point as well, that there's many people who have been seeing just dead bodies alongside the road. Um, oftentimes like these are people that they know as well. So there might be uh, neighbors, they might be their friends. Um, many times it's also their family members. Um, you also hear that there are male family members that are being forced to uh, rape women and girls in the household or um, they, they're you know, threatened with death. Um, and sometimes like usually that, that usually is what happens at the end of the day anyway, so they'll, they'll die. Um, and then for those in the diaspora, it's also just like the trauma of not being able to speak to your family and um, know that they're okay um, because there's like the lack of electricity, um, communication lines have been down for quite some time as well. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, for, for those who were able to leave as well, so there are many, there have been some Tigrayans who were in Ethiopia during the uh, start of the war. And uh, it's also traumatic when, you know, you're a family member and you, are living in another country and you're a citizen of that country and you're able to leave, you have um, either like the US government or Australian government or whomever being able to take you out um, and you're leaving all these family members behind. So there's just like a, there's a pain and just like leaving them there. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's, it's a war that is not only happening on the ground, but it's also a psychological one too. Wow, thank you so much Bisrat and, um, Thank you for painting that picture of, you know, it's not just a local incident. It's, it's affecting across that country, across Africa and around the world because Ethiopia is so intricate, intricately connected to the rest of the world, be it directly by people's families who are all over um, in other countries or by the trade or by whatever else is, is taking place. So I do appreciate that, that perspective. Thank you. And last but not least, Maza, um, may you please describe what's happening in Ethiopia um, to your perspective in one word and let us know why you chose that word. Um, I want to apologize for my rusty voice. This is from a protest. Uh, we just had a successful protest yesterday, so that's why. Uh, but what's happening in Ethiopia, particularly in, in terms of um, what's happening to the people of Tigray in for me is just pure genocide. What's happening is a genocide. Um, I say that because 
the people of Tigray for the past over 143 days have been exterminated in the dark. Um, I say this because all communication channels have been disconnected, cut off on November 4th, and then a genocidal war has been waged upon them by the Ethiopian federal government. Uh, in, and the, the Ethiopian federal government um, invited a foreign enemy in order to support its mission of extermination. Um, as Bissara said, it has been over four months since we have heard from our family members. Uh, but we know the very limited access we have to Tigray. We know people are being killed left and right. Left and right. Women, young girls, as young as eight years old, are being gang raped by military um, members and also by militias. Um, people are literally dying of preventable diseases because they don't have access to medicine. And, and this is mainly because hospitals have been looted. So what's happening is a pure act of genocide. And it's, it's very heartbreaking because, um, you know, most of the time we hear of wars as an elusive thing, but it's affecting each every one of us. And so it's, it's very devastating. Uh, but just to use one word, what's happening is a genocide and it's a state sponsored genocide. Thank you so much, Maza, for, for sharing that perspective and for letting us know um, the real impact of what's happening here. I think a lot of times, I know personally, um, being in the Washington DC area, we may get some news, we may you know, read it in the paper, um, hear it in New York Times, BBC, um, but it's usually shared with more, um, I wanna say poetic language. If I, if I can say that kind of thing. Um, so it is important to really speak truth to what's happening and how it's really affecting people and how we feel about it. So I do appreciate all three of you for your candor today, um, for your vulnerability and coming on and, and sharing your perspective. And, and I understand it's not easy and we're still in the middle of this conflict and what's going on. So um, again, I just want to take the time to appreciate you joining us and sharing your stories. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, we have some folks on here who maybe are not as um, in tune with what's happening on the ground. Um, so can either one of the three of you share um, kind of the origin tale of why we're here today and why we're having this conversation. You can get as academic as you want, as um, you know, 101 as you want, or, or however you want to, to describe it. I just want to make sure that um, we're extending grace to the people who may not necessarily understand what happened and, and why. Yeah, so I think that um, there's, there's so much. When you talk about the root of the issue, I think it could be traced back to many, many years ago. Um, but I think that, you know, to just try and keep things at least like brief and succinct here, um, I think you can come down to 2018. Um, so this is like when Abiy Ahmed was uh, selected. He was never elected um, to lead a transitional government until the elections happen. And at the center of all of this, I think it really just comes down to like this quest of power, but it comes at the expense of um, you know, giving people, giving a region its right to self-determination, which is something that's guaranteed uh, in the Ethiopian constitution. And so, you know, Abiy Ahmed was selected. He he was he spent a lot of years actually loyal to uh, the the TPLF, which is the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or at least uh, Melis Anawi, who was the prime minister of Ethiopia. Um, and it's also you know to be noted that the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Um, wasn't just ruling Ethiopia during that time, it was the EPRDF. So there's a lot of acronyms here, I'm gonna try and break them down for us. Uh, the EPRDF, so it's the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. And so this is a representation of um, a coalition of parties that uh, basically represented regions across Ethiopia. And this, there was a system in place called um, ethnic federalism which gives regions the right to their own self-determination, which includes like, you know, having the freedom to elect their own governments, uh, running things the way that they'd want to. Um, and so I'd also say like, you know, the principle of self-determination was ingrained in so much and uh, the actual practice of it is a whole other conversation. Um, and so, you know, in 2018, when, when Abiy Ahmed was selected, 
uh, he soon began this wave of reforms. Um, he was freeing all these political prisoners. He was, um, I want to could be honest here, but I think he also brought back the Ottoman Liberation Front. Um, he also asked them to disarm. And then he was creating this peace agreement with Isaias Afwarki, who is the dictator of Eritrea. And I mean, to this day, we still don't know what's actually in that peace pact. Um, but we do know like two things that one, he gave Isaias um, a highly contested area of land that, you know, was, you know, in many conversations between TPLF as well as um, the Eritrean government, it was a place called Badme. And then number two, it also allowed for borders that touched Tigray um, to open between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, so, you know, Tigray is up in Northern Ethiopia. So when we saw that map, um, so that means essentially that the borders would touch uh, Tigray and Eritrea. And so this was like a very joyous moment for many people. They hadn't seen their family in, for, for many people, they hadn't seen their family in Eritrea in quite some time. Um, and, you know, for the most part, many of us were also seeing these reforms and were excited about all of the, the this new chapter for Ethiopia as well. And just like seeing um, us, can, you know, in, in thriving. And so he got um, a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Abiy Ahmed did for, all of these efforts, like these different reforms. Um, but while most of the world was focused on the reforms, he was basically undoing all of these things around that time period as well. So all these political prisoners that he freed, he ended up uh, either jailing back some of them or additional ones, um, a lot of like different opponents. Um, and then he also closed the borders with Eritrea um, in less than a year than they were opened. Um, and he was, uh, you know, over the course of the two years that he was also, you know, um, in power, he, we also saw that there was an incredible amount of ethnic violence across the country, and this was increasing. Um, so there was, you know, both state-sponsored uh, violence as well as like state-led um, at the hands of like Ethiopian police or Hana militias, and this is particularly in Oromia and Benishanko Um and so, you know, in 2020, we were supposed to see elections. That's basically what he came here to do. Um, and Abby had decided to postpone them because of COVID, which could be a fair reason, but he's also jailing now more than 50,000 Ottoman political prisoners. Um, his actions just don't add up. And so Tigray decided to hold their own elections, which is legal according to the constitution. And he saw this as a threat to their power. Um, and then, you know, TPLF was then elected by the people of Tigray to represent and govern them moving forward. This was back in September 2020. And then in the months leading up to the war, Abiy basically uh, began inflicting harm and violence to the people of Tigray, not providing aid or supplies when it comes to the uh, worst locust infestations that the region had seen, as well as, um, and these locusts were harming their crops and their main sources of food, as well as blockage of food uh, or blockages of road and such began as well. Um, and then more officially on November 4th, he began the war on Tigray with Isaiah Safawarki, who, you know, he created that peace agreement with back in 2018. So I'll just pause here since that was quite a bit, but um, those are kind of the, the main elements that kind of led to this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as you so eloquently shared, um, this isn't new. This, this isn't something that just happened yesterday. And, you know, even though maybe some people are just learning about it, it's been happening at least this segment of it, um, at least since 2018. So it's about three years of, of dealing with social unrest and kind of political um, fighting um, both within Ethiopia and outside and understanding that Things such as state-sponsored violence um, or state-led is incredibly traumatic and incredibly divisive. So to have to then operate as a country, um, you know, with this with this prime minister and understanding that um, the outside world is saying one thing, but everyone's living something totally different inside of that, um, I just want to make sure that we're continuing to, to share this voice and, and making sure that your voices are, are heard um, for this experience. So thank you for, for giving it the, that high level um, sharing. I wanted to feed off of that. Yeah, of course. Add to it. So mm -hmm. uh, she started with 2018 and what I would call the promise of democracy, right? Oh, that's um, good. And so I wanted also to connect it back to, you know, coffee and 
Um, when you saw the map uh, at the beginning, um, most of the coffee comes from Oromia region as well as uh, the southern region. Um, and one of the biggest things about coffee in Ethiopia is the fact that it enhanced the economy of Ethiopia. About 50 to, I think, 50 to 60 percent of uh, foreign income comes from the exporting of coffee. But when you look at that, it's like, where is the revenue going? Is it going to the people or is it going to the government? And it's definitely going to the government. Um, I remember my family's uh, dominantly from the east side of um, Oromia or Ethiopia. And they're like, oh, we make a lot of money, but you know, the government takes a big portion of it. So I was thinking about that in connection to what um, Basara said. And I think it's, it's a systematic issue in the sense that if you look at how much um, the history of Ethiopia and to the point to where we got now. So it was first a, you know, a kings and queens, that's what you had. And then after that, we went into communism in the, you know, 18, uh, 1980s, 1970s. And then from that, did we become a democracy, uh, a so-called democracy? The last prime minister was in power for 17 years. And the only reason um, that rule ended was because he died. And then that um, created space for Abi uh, to uh, become in power. But what's important in relationship to Ethiopia, uh, democracy, and what's currently the violence that happened, because before what actually gave Abi the power to be selected was the Oromo protest in 2016. And the Oromo protest started because of um, land grab issues. So if you go back historically, uh, and I had to look deep into this because um, this is not something that I'm, you know, very much exposed to, but I do see it directly from my family's experience. And in like the 1970s, uh, when Mangistu and the Dirk or the communist uh, party was in power, what they essentially did is that they gave all of the land became the government's power. And what they wanted to do, if they wanted to give it to their friends, they would give it to them. So, you know, you have constant issues of um, the government coming and just destroying um, crops or destroying things that have been built that people have been uh, living on. And that creates uh, tension because if you're a pastoral country or if 50% of your resources um, economy comes from the land that you live on, how can you actually succeed and not be uh, peasants that is entirely dependent on the on the um, on the government to succeed. So that's how it ties back to what's currently happening right now. Thank you so much, and and thank you also for providing that beautiful segue <laughs> into um, how this relates to coffee, right? So this isn't necessarily um, something that we wanted to come up with just because. Um, we're a coffee company and Ethiopia is known as the cradle or the birthplace of coffee, we wanted to show that this was a universal issue and something that we should all be aware of. Um, but as I think some people, someone said in the chat, 65% of the coffee is from the Oromia region. Um, and I did find a, a fact from the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service it says in 2018, 2019, Ethiopian exports are estimated to reach 3.98 million, million with an M, bags of coffee, making it once again, the most important African coffee exporter and the 10th largest exporter in the world. So I want to thank you for sharing that, especially about your connection, your family connection to coffee is, you know, uh, I don't know how many coffee um, aficionados we have on the, on the webinar today or we'll be watching later, um, but oftentimes we're not thinking about that when we're drinking our cup of, of single origin uh, fair trade coffee from Ethiopia, right? Thinking about, you know, how are the people in Ethiopia actually benefiting from this? And so I want to, to thank you for sharing that information because um, this is all interrelated. Um, the economy, 
money, revenue, leadership, power, add coffee in there, add people's lives, and it's a universal issue. So I, I do appreciate you sharing that. Um, so in, in talking about just the impact of Ethiopia in the world, um, how would you describe, and, and I'll go first to Maza, how would you describe the impact of the crises being felt throughout the country? Or do you see it mainly just in the Tigray region? Or what would you say is kind of the, the impact? Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, the impact is highly felt within the Tigray region. Um, I say this because um, with the very limited access we have to Tigray, we have learned that over 60,000 civilians have been killed so far. Um, these are children, men, university students, church um, priests, and grandmas, and, and you know, civilians who do not have any participation whatsoever in political matters. Um, to, to make that worse, girls are being raped. Only in Magala, the capital city of Tigray, we have heard that over 700 women have been gang raped by troops. Um, and uh, to add to that, you have over 4.5 million people Tigrayans facing man-made famine. So although the destabilizing effect of this war is being felt everywhere across Ethiopia, with people in, in Oromia facing, uh, you know, state-sponsored violence and, and then in the northern nation and national it's people going through the same kind of experience but the impact of all of this war is highly pronounced in Tigray because every public infrastructure in Tigray has been destroyed all developmental gains that the Tigray people have worked hard and achieved in the past 30 plus years have been turned into nothing like you would literally would find nothing if you go to Tigray right now even like kettles, you know, like horses, uh, oxes that farmers used to depend on have been looted and transported to Eritrea, to the neighboring country. So uh, the impact is far reaching. It's also affecting Horn of Africa's stability because most of, you know, the Horn of African countries uh, are um, implicated either politically or um, militarily. However, you know, the, the impact is far worse and highly pronounced in Tigray. Uh, I say that because every household in, Tig in Tigray has lost a family member or a friend because of this nonsensical, nonsensical and genocidal war. And this is mainly because uh, you have a group of people that are hell-bent on um, you know, establishing a, a one ethnic group's hegemony within Ethiopia. And then you have another group of people that are very much determined to have their right self-administration and their right self-determination. So the fight is not necessarily between Ethiopia and Tigray. It's rather between these two conflicting ideologies and theories of, you know, self-rule, self-governance and imposition of a selected uh, or unelected governance over a group of people. So because of this reason, Tigrans in particular are being exterminated in the dark and the impact is really, really high. It's even high. It's, it's even very difficult to put it into words because the pain the people of Tigray are going through is unimaginable. It's something that we have never experienced. And yet this is not the first civil war that we experienced as a group of people, but the pain is far greater than anything we have ever seen before. Thank you for sharing that, Maza. Um, I think that you made a very good point about it's not just an issue of politics or military or economy. It's just about wanting to have self-preservation. And that's in the Ethiopian constitution, it's supposed to be promised, right? So I, I can, I would say that maybe other people um, from other countries can understand that fight and understand why it's so important to fight for that right um, that was promised to them. Um, so Bisrat Ayantu, um, do either of you want to speak on the impact of the crises, maybe in other parts of Ethiopia, or just further elaborate on the impact that um, it's being felt in Tigray? Yeah, so I definitely just like echo what Maza just said. Um, there is quite a bit, there is a significant amount of um, 
horror that is happening within Tigai. And this is like coming at the hands of a few perpetrators. So it's the Ethiopian, um, Ethiopian soldiers, um, Eritrean troops, um, Amhara militias. Uh, and then you also have like these like other factors such as the UAE drone. So the United Arab Emirates um, drones have been used to uh, bomb you know, various parts of Tigray. And, and this has been not just on, you know, destruction of buildings and such, but these bomb, th these aerial bombardments have actually hit and killed civilians as well as wounded them too. And so you see like a lot of these pictures of like young children who are um, either, you know, significantly injured or have been killed at the hands of um, these perpetrators. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of horror, a lot of trauma that's happening within uh, Tigray. Um, and because there's also this genocidal war that has been uh, created by these various perpetrators, the other thing too is, you know, to Maz's point, the geopolitics of this has also been quite um, like horrific to see that like the Horn of Africa is becoming less and less unstable. And so, you know, with one Sudan, there are a significant amount of refugees in Sudan. Now there's around like 60,000 plus. Um, the only reason why we're seeing that number is because there have been Ethiopian soldiers that have been at the border and they've been stopping people from going into Sudan. And then you also um, have that, you know, there's Ethiopian troops that have left the Al Fashka uh, Triangle, um, which is like this area that also borders Sudan. And so um, this has been an area of land that has been contested since, you know, for many, many years. And essentially Sudan moved in to get the land and now they're on the brink of a border war. Ethiopian soldiers have killed some of Sudan's civilians there as well. And then you also have Ethiopian uh, peacekeeping troops uh, leaving other countries to come in again for this war on Tigray. And so there in Somalia, for example, Al-Shabaab has, um, which is like a terrorist group, has re-entered into uh, their country because Ethiopian forces, one of the reasons at least is because Ethiopian forces have, um, or peacekeeping troops have left that country as well. And so the geopolitics of this, you know, has been quite interesting as well, just seeing that there are, it's not just, you know, Ethiopia that's being affected, but it's all these other countries you have for the U.S. Red Sea trade interests that are also being affected, uh, that could potentially be affected. And, um, yeah, it, it just comes back down to like the humanitarian crisis of all of this, but that's the, that's the biggest thing that I would add. Yeah, let, uh, to add on that um, from, um, especially from the Oromia region and how that's kind of like blending in, borders are fictitious. It's just, there are lines that are drawn, but when it comes to people, um, it's, everybody gets impacted. So what's happening actually currently as of past weekend is um, a region called uh, Wallo, which has a high population of Oromo people, is really close to the Tigray region. So the conflicts that are currently happening in Tigray are bleeding into um, other regions of Ethiopia. So the Amara militia came into Wallo and did exactly what they're doing. And one of the statements that was said is that they have finished cleansing doing an ethnic cleansing of Tigray, and now they're getting into Oromia. Um, another thing also like uh, what's happening, a lot of people are leaving um, Tigray and they're going to Sudan. Another issue is a refugee crisis. We're just adding to it. Um, we have a lot of uh, Oromos that are leaving from, because of the, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing crisis. It's been going on every single day. Um, so it goes, beyond um, just what's happening right now with Tigray is just, just a massive impact happening in a small amount of window but with um, other regions um, even maybe uh, Benishangul is that it's been happening for so long so now we have a lot of people that are leaving the country just fleeing for a better life so Yemen is one of them um, uh, a few weeks ago there was a bombing um, in Yemen of the uh, detention center of refugees that, I mean, bodies were burned alive because they were caught in between um, the conflict between Saudi and Yemen. So it's increasing the refugee crisis. It is unstabilizing the, um, the Horn of Africa, which is a huge interest for the United States. Um, and it's just, it's just adding on and what are, it's people, you know, I think we, we don't look at it from that uh, perspective. 
war impacts people and civilians shouldn't be caught in between. Thank you so much, um, all three of you for, for your perspective on that. And I definitely want to segue um, what you just mentioned, Ayan, to this refugee crisis and war impacting people, right? It, you know, these are figures, these are, you know, dollar signs, these are borders, but at the end of the day, these are people that are being impacted. Um, so because of having the three of you amazing um, women here with us today and understanding that it is, at least in America, Women's History Month, we want to make sure that we're bringing it and tying it into women and girls, uh, which are often kind of the silence part of, of these big conversations. Um, I know it was mentioned before, uh, we are seeing some gender-based violence and sexual violence in nature, um, which is traumatic and, and horrific. And so I just want to see if, if anyone wants to touch upon um, how else women and girls are being impacted on the ground, um, or maybe also if you're seeing any women and girls doing the work towards ending the conflict as well. So kind of both sides, we're seeing, you know, the, the kind of not necessarily calling them victims, but definitely people who are being impacted, but then also are we seeing kind of a, a resilient um, kind of pushback from women and girls as well? Yeah, so I think um, I can start off here and Maza also, like she has a lot of work within this space as well, just from being the co-founder of Yokono and everything. So I think she will have a lot to, to add, but I think um, on my side, I think that we can hear all the numbers um, and it, it feels like it's so distant, right? So as of recently, we learned that there were thousands of cases of weaponized sexual and gender-based violence that was happening in Tigray to women and girls. Um, so there's like girls that are as young as um, eight, if not younger. Um, and there's also just like a stigma of also reporting. So the thousands is, is a, an at least number, but it's not the fullest extent. Um, and we also have heard that um, rape isn't just a consequence of the war, right? Like it should never be expected, period. Um, but it's not a consequence of the war, but it's actually being used as a weapon of the war. And so many uh, soldiers have been threatening violence or death to these women and girls if they don't, uh, you know, basically allow themselves to be raped by them. Um, and so this is happening at the hands again of Ethiopian soldiers, Eritrean soldiers, some kind of militias. And there has been, you know, to, to, the to the effect of like weapon of war, as well as, you know, to the effect of genocide, um, there have been survivors, rape survivors, who have mentioned that the uh, soldiers or the Amhada militias are looking to basically amhadanize them or amhadanize their blood, their bloodline, basically cleansing them of this, mm -hmm. um, their specific ethnic group and their identity as Tigrayans um, so that they can, I guess, you know, give birth to uh, these, these mixed children and um, essentially just it changes the social makeup of a group. And this is something that, you know, by the definition of genocide, this is, uh, this is, this is exactly what it entails. And so, you hear this, you hear that there are many, like there's just so many horrific stories as well. Just there's, you know, there was one story of um, a, a girl who was raped by 23, gang raped by 23 Eritrean soldiers mm. um, over the period of 10 days. And so you hear a lot more stories of just gang raped over a significant amount of days. And then just recently I actually heard um, from a, a story that essentially was saying that they were looking, there's like one media that has been able to access Tigra and there's been very limited media in general that's been allowed in, but the one hospital, not Tigrat, uh, which is a town in Tigra, had over uh, 200 rape survivors and 160 of them, 160 out of the 200 were pregnant. And so there is not much capacity left at these, uh, the, at these places because there's quite a bit of survivors that are coming in. And this, again, just doesn't take the extent of it. So they're giving them a lot of pregnancy tests and, and testing for HIV, STIs, et cetera. Um, and then you also see that mothers are shaving off their uh, daughter's hair so that like in the region, so that it, they are not presented as, as girls or women or people who should be taken advantage of. So there is, there's a lot to this. Uh, something that I also personally feel is just the, the effect that it has on pregnant women. So I was saying earlier that they were giving birth en route to Sudan as they were walking for hours or days just to get there. 
or at the refugee camp. And there was one story in particular that always sticks with me. And it was of a woman, of a pregnant woman who gave birth in uh, Sudan at a refugee camp, but she wasn't able to take a shower for seven, seven days after she gave birth. So you have like, you know, all of this blood after giving birth and not being able to take a shower, like just, just sitting in your blood for quite some time afterwards. It's pretty horrific, but that's, those are some of the couple of things that are the stories that I've heard that just really stick with me. Yeah, just to add to what Sarah said, um, the girl actually who was gang raped by 23 Eritrean troops, her name is Lim Lim. Um, she's only 28 years old. Uh, I think it's very important to honor the survivors because they're, you know, they're strong enough, they're heroic enough to tell us, to tell us what exactly happened to them. And I think it's very critical that we honor them, say their names. And, and so her name is Lam Lam, and she's only 28 years old. Uh, she was gang raped while she was searching for food, because as I said, Eritrean troops are you know, actively ravaging the whole region of Tigray, in addition to Amhara militias and the Ethiopian army. And one of the things they did is burn their crops. They literally burn the farmers' crops. And our people do not have anything to eat because everything that they have worked hard for, for you know, throughout the year has been destroyed. So people are being internally displaced. And Lem Lem happened to be one of them. She was, you know, she left her village looking for food. She was, you know, on her way uh, to a bank that she heard was open. So this military man found her on her way, you know, looking for food. After they found her, they raped her, but they didn't. After they raped her for days and days, filled her private parts with sharp objects. Was dirt, you know. They literally China was tissue and um, nails. There is a very graphic video detailing all of this. While doctors in the Adigrat Hospital were trying to extract those foreign objects from her. So what is happening to the women of Tigray is it's very traumatic. It leaves a generational trauma with them, and unfortunately. Our body, like the women to grand bodies, is being used as a battlefield to, to torture the, the women themselves, but also to terrorize the people of Tigray. Because um, this, you know, invading forces, they understand the value that we give to women within Tigray. And so they're trying to subjugate the people of Tigray by attacking the one and one member of their community they so very much respect and love. So in addition to all the displacement in addition to all being you know migrated to a foreign country uh, by leaving everything you knew to be normal behind the Tigrayan women bodies being used as a weapon of war uh, they're being tortured violated and raped and to make things worse this woman do not even have you know a system that would help them to you know get the kind of service that a survivor would demand right uh, so this starts from counseling, from, you know, medical services. Um, most of the women, like the stories that we're telling you, these are people that were fortunate enough to even to go to hospitals. Majority of the rape survivors, majority of the victims who's in Tigray do not even have access to hospitals. So uh, just yesterday, I heard, you know, a group of young girls, like who's in the age between, ranging between 14 and 19, they were raped but they didn't want to go anywhere because they know if they go and speak up, they're gonna get more, you know, they're gonna be tortured even more. So they, they were trying to terminate the pregnancy by themselves and they died. So the, what's happening to them is really, really painful, particularly to the women of Tigray, because as I said, collectively as a member of the Tigran society, as a member of the Tigran community, they're being hurt, they're being violated through, you know, starting from weaponized hunger and, and, and lack of you know, access to, to cash, to money, to food, but to make things much worse, their bodies are being used as battleground. They're raped day and night and they cannot even speak about it. If they do, their family will be killed right in front of them. And their, their parents, like they're being forced to rape them. Like grandparents are being forced to rape their own children at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. 
so I I know this is very traumatizing for some people, and I apologize that we didn't give you know trigger warning before we started talking about this. But you know the pain is too much that we even forget about this kind of things. Yeah. So um, I, I I just want to encourage everyone to watch you know a documentary that was you know prepared by the same in detailing everything that's happening to the women of Tigray and let's all remember to honor and to remember the names of these victims at least as of now we know two girls were been brave enough to tell their stories to the media and their names is Mona Lisa and Lam Lam very very important to honor them Thank you so much for sharing that, Maza. And I do want to make sure that we're holding space to honor the survivors and everyone who's been impacted by this on the ground. Um, and uh, again, apologies for not necessarily sharing the trigger warning, um, but this is this is real. This is what's happening. This is real pain that you're seeing um, as these stories are being shared. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to honor um, all of the survivors and everyone's being impacted. Lam Nam, Mona Lisa, um, and understand that this is only a small fraction of, of what we know um, because of how these stories are being silenced and how people are being silenced on the ground. So thank you for, for sharing that. And we wanna make sure that we're holding space for them. Um, so with that, I wanted to transition and, and really understand um, what the work is that you're doing um, the three of you, um, because you're at the forefront of these movements. You're you're talking about this on a regular basis. You're you're involved. You're um, doing what you can. So, what keeps you inspired and motivated to keep going? Because I know any other person probably hearing a lot of um, kind of horrific, traumatic stories, they would probably you know not necessarily feel like they're getting anywhere. So I want to see, you know, what's what's really inspiring you to continue talking about it, to continue in the movement, and to continue to be here with us today and and share your stories. So um, for me, I just I wanted to add to what Maza said, and I am 28 and I had a baby like seven months ago. So that experience of being pregnant and um, you know just being at you know, the, as weak as you can be, not being able to move. Um, the only reason, and I think this might be why most of us who have left the country keep on doing what we do, is that I got lucky to be to come here, right? Um, while they didn't. I don't know if it's survivor's guilt, um, but that's a big motivation for me personally. Um, so from a woman's perspective, like women always get the worst. Um, they are the most vulnerable. They, um, especially if you're a pastoral, if you depend on your land, if you, if that's your source of, um, living, you are just going to get the, the worst of it. Um, for me personally, what made the biggest impact from a woman's perspective is I came to the U S when I was 10. Um, I, I was born in the city. I was, uh, I had everything, um, but my dad's side of the family, I mean, they live up in the high mountains in Hutter and uh, coffee used to be the main source of their life. Um, but what has happened because of um, the fact that climate change, uh, geopolitics, all of that stuff is that people have actually transitioned from coffee to um, selling cash crops like chat, which is very prominent. It is um, a stimulant that's very uh, similar to uh, Adderall, but think of the fact that kids at a very young age uh, chew it. It's being chewed every single day and it has um, psychological effects if you're uh, using it for a prolonged amount of time. And I remember um, when I went back, you know, we thought everything was changing. This was in 2018. Um, and just seeing these women in the streets, like selling, they were, I mean, it was 6 a.m. They were selling, uh, they were the business women, they were succeeding and they just, they had this motivation um, that kept them strong. And 
you know, that being taken away from them or a portion of their profit going to the government in order to be used for weapons um, to attack civilians, uh, like it's currently happening right now. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just really sad just looking at in, into the numbers because, you know, follow the money, that's where you're going to find out the cause of the problem. But what keeps me motivated is the fact I at least have a chance um, to speak up for them. Um, while my cousins, we're talking one generation, are still back home um, dealing with diseases, farming, their husbands leaving them, them having no resources. And that was just because my dad decided to leave the, the, the countryside. And then he got an education and somehow we landed here. So using my um, benefits, um, my blessings to give back to my community and to my people. Thank you so much. Israt? Yeah, I think so for myself, it, it really comes down to just like the spirit of a people. Um, I think that for, so I was born in the States, I was born actually in Philly. Um, so I, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I, um, and I see, you know, like I'm not, like I, I've only been to, to Tigray maybe uh, twice in my life um, and have been very connected to my grandmother and, uh, and all of our cousins and family members all there. But I think what comes down to for me is like with all the wars that have happened within Tigray, with all of the oppression that has happened in Tigray, like it, it really just comes down to like the spirit of a people has, has always kept um, like unbroken. There is like this... Uh, there's this ideology of, of Woyane, which is essentially a, um, like, it's like a focus on, you know, making sure that people have the freedom. It's, it's focused on revolutionaries. It's also focused on uh, just, you know, this idea of self-determination and making sure that people have the right to um, elect their own governments and kind of run their own, their own regions and have that freedom as they wish. And so for me, it's, you know, it comes down to the spirit of the people you saw, you see it if you ever participate also in just like the protests um, where everyone is chanting together and we're chanting against like these, you know, for an oppressive cause um, or for an oppressive reason. Um, but for the most part, people are in this together. We, we often say um, that, you know, we're like united together, uh, we become undivided. And so that's just, that's just something that I think is very powerful. And then I think the other thing too is just the optimism for a better future. I mean, so much of our future, so much of our movement currently is being led by women and uh, and girls. And we're excited to see, you know, I'm very excited to see at least how we continue to bring more women into leadership positions moving forward and um, how they have, you know, continued voice and we we fight for uh, against the oppression of, of women and girls continuing on. So that's, those are two big things for myself. Thank you. Maza, did you want to share anything? Yeah. Um, for me, you know, as an orphan girl, a young lady who was raised by a single mother, very strong one, and very loving brothers, I understand the role one person can play in terms of changing another person's life, in terms of, you know, creating a better future. Uh, and I also know what it feels to be abandoned, to be left alone without anyone speaking up for you. So, with Tigray being under siege, having so many enemies, both local and foreign enemies, starting from the Eritrean government all the way to the Arab United Emirates, who is sending drones that are being actively used to ravage you know, cities and towns across Tigray. I understand I have a role to play in terms of amplifying the plight of my people, because not doing so would mean to be, to be complacent in all of the, the horrific things that are happening to my people. I was fortunate enough, like everyone else, like I am to say, to be, you know, to be at the, at the place where I am, to have the academic uh, background that I have. And it's only right that I use it for the service of my people. Because if I don't do that, nobody else is going to do. Particularly because the people of Tigray have been dehumanized and vilified for the past over 30 years. No matter what we do, no matter our you know, journey towards equality, towards creating a better Ethiopia where nation and nationalities are respected equally and have the right to exercise their identity without anyone trying 
trying you know to impose a whole different kind of identity up of them we have been pictured as this you know spoiled kid that had everything they wished for that's not what happened i was born in tigray i was raised in tigray i know the struggle my mom passed through in order for me to be here i know what kind of life a Tigrayan woman lives in the rural parts of Tigray. However, most Ethiopians do not see us for who we are because all the governments that have came before this leadership and including this Abiy Ahmed, Abi Ahmed Prime Minister of Ethiopia have been used state-sponsored media propaganda in order to paint a picture of us being privileged. We are not. And that's why you see not so many people speaking up against the, the genocide, against the pain and suffering that the people of Tigray are going through because there is this image that has been portrayed about us. But as a Tigran who was born and raised in Tigray, I know what kind of life we live. And I know if I don't speak up, nobody else is going to do it. And at the same time, like I want to say, there is a, 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 you know, a sense of, what is it, the, the feeling of guiltness that I feel every time I go to bed, the only thing I can see is body flashing through my eyes because we see the videos coming to us. We hear the stories, the cry of innocent lives, innocent kids that are being left behind in the cities that are being bombed day and night. So for me, it's the trauma, but also the fear of the plight not being amplified globally that keeps me going. The pain is really the real. We have to watch every single video, you know, as activists and leaders of this movement, we don't even have the luxury of not watching things because they're too horrifying. We have to see each and every of it because we have a job to explain to big journalists to cover them, you know, to reach out to allies, to explain what exactly is happening on the ground. So our work is very difficult, but at the same time, it's an honor we're much obliged to be of service to our people. So no matter how difficult it is, uh, it's knowing that nobody else is going to be there for our people that keeps us going. And as Basra said, we all are Wayanti. We refer to ourselves as Wayanti. To be Wayani means you know, to revolt against, revolt against subjugation, to revolt against oppression. So all throughout our history as Tigrans, we have revolted and fought against suppression and oppression. And I think it's something that is enshrined within us growing up. We, we all, you know, we we are like this little girls who fight against separation, like in, in all different, I mean, oppression comes in all different forms, right? Even at home, when you're a girl, you're like, hey, you know, don't make too much noise, shut up. But you continue to fight. And that's the, it's that burning desire feature. And it's that way and spirit that we all have within us that keeps us going. Thank you so much. Um, that has been super inspiring and, and hearing your individual stories about what keeps you going. Um, I answer that survivor's guilt. I know a lot of us can can resonate with that, whether it's you know from a global scale um, of people who have immigrated from other countries, or even you know if you're in the states and maybe you you know end up a little bit better. I think uh, you know oftentimes we call it, especially in the African-American community, the black tax, right? It's like you feel some way and it's like you have to now give back because you necessarily have the survivor's guilt of, of moving forward. So understanding what that looks like and how we can actually make an impact, I think is, is really um, crucial to this and um, based on sharing the spirit of the people. I think that's something that is also a universal um, theme um, understanding the resilience of people and what can happen if we stick together, if we come together and really fight for what's right in terms of protecting one another and actually loving one another. I think that's a really great outlook to have, um, especially with, with all the horrific traumatic things happening. It's, you know, we must continue to um, encourage one another and keep looking for a more positive future that we can create. I think that's really important. It's something that we can create within our lifetime, ideally. Um, and Ma uh, Maza, I really love what you shared about the role one person can play and whether it's impacting one other person or impacting the world. And I think oftentimes we 
especially when the, it's, it's, you know, other movements happening in the US or around the world, it's like, what can I do? I'm just one person. Um, but understanding that you can make a single impact on one person who then impacts someone else, who then impacts the community. And really understanding that we all have a role to play with that. Um, so we have received a few questions from our audience. And so what I'm seeing are some similar questions about um, what can we do to move forward and solve the problem? Um, so I know, especially the coffee consumers that are on this um, webinar are asking that. Um, someone else said, how can the um, Otomo and Tigray community work together since they have the same cause? So if um, all three of you, we can kind of speak to either, um, you know, what people around the world, the international community, coffee consumers can do to, to help out. Um, and then as well as people that are presently in Ethiopia who are in those communities, um, what can they what can they do? Yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, what people can do who are in the coffee industry, I, I, I'd probably separate this out into like, you know, what you can do as a business owner and then also what you can do as just like an individual person. Um, so I think that uh, first, the stories that we shared here today are just like, you know, individual stories that again, you know, to Maz's point, we, we heard about, like we were, we were lucky enough to hear about through the media or through people who've been able to tell us. There are a lot of stories that we haven't heard yet. And so I just constantly think about, you know, if, if these are just a couple of stories and yet there are thousands of uh, rape survivors and there are millions of people who are, are at risk of starvation. Um, it's like, you just think about the magnitude of what that may actually, like the weight of that. So just like taking one of those stories and multiplying it out by the millions is quite devastating. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the thing to note, like, so as business owners, in terms of what people can do in the coffee industry, I'd say one big thing is really just like educating others. So I think that the coffee industry is, um, is quite a, a beautiful industry. It gets so much traction from so many different types of people. And I think that's very powerful in and of itself. And so there's an opportunity to let other people know about what's happening in Tigray, what's happening in Northern Ethiopia, um, the, the impact of it and help us in stopping the genocide that's happening. And I know that the other thing here too, is that many people, um, you know, as they kind of like learn a little bit more about the conflict are, uh, they see that there is like a humanitarian crisis that's happening, but they're afraid of saying anything because they feel like they're taking sides. Um, whether that means, you know, if they have a, um, a couple of friends who may be of a of different ethnic group, they feel that they may be uh, siding with the uh, Tigrayan people versus like that other ethnic group, or they may feel that there's like another side of, you know, siding with the TPL at the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is a political party that has um, governed Ethiopia, um, versus siding with the government or, you know, the federal government or what other, like, you know, another government of the other regions. And so I'd like to kind of, you know, break it down and say that this is a humanitarian crisis. This is a, a genocide that's happening. And so really the only sides that are here are, you know, are you on the side of genocide or are you not? Are you on the side of the people, humanity, or are you not? Um, so those are the biggest things. And I would say that you can kind of come at it from, from that perspective, but also recognizing that the humanitarian um, crisis will only be solved uh, through that political side. So just bringing those two conversations um, in, direct, uh, in direct contact with each other. So that's what you can do as, from a business, uh, business owner perspective, so just educating others. The other thing too, as just like an individual is raising awareness. So I'd highly recommend following Omna Tigray, it's O-M-N-A-T-I-G-R-A-Y, Omna Tigray on Instagram and Twitter. And so we focus on various action-driven campaigns. Um, a lot of what we do is educated advocacy and we are also nonpartisan. And we're a different uh, collective of Tigrayans that have been represented across many countries, not just the US. Um, and so we provide content that really just helps people in understanding the conflict and post-war, focusing on all the rebuilding uh, efforts. And so we do a lot of different campaigns. Um, a lot of our demands, uh, or a lot of our, you know, um, asks are like largely focused on getting Eritrean troops out of Tigray, which is largely focused on um, how we can also help in ending the humanitarian crisis, um, as well as all the other invading forces, so Mahara militias and um, Ethiopian forces as well. Um, and then I'd also say just like as an individual too, just call your elected officials. Um, so, you know, letting them know again, one, removing uh, all these invading forces out of Tigray, um, 
asking for un unhindered humanitarian access, so nothing blocked, unhindered media access as well. And then we focus on independent investigations led by the UN and the UN only. So there is now a joint agreement between the UN and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission um, to investigate the crimes and uh, that are happening within Tigray, but we know that the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission is not is not independent, though it may say it is. It is state funded. It is state appointed, um, and so we fear that there are uh, these investigations, if they were to happen with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, are not going to be credible. Um, nor will they actually get true justice. And so those are some of the biggest things that that I would say from our side. Yeah, just to add a few points on to what Bistra said. Um, the key point here is educate yourself. Educate yourself about what's happening in Tigray. And to educate yourself, follow you know all these international, international media outlets, but also Omna Tigray. Once you educate yourself, be an ally, speak up because your voice matters. You have the power to make a difference in all of this. And once you speak up, also continue to, um, sorry about the background noise, also continue, you know, to, to constantly call upon your elected officials because the only reason why the Ethiopian government is continuing to exterminate the people of Tigray is because it's emboldened by the inaction of the global leaders. You have international community that continues to, to release statements of concern. However, concern doesn't really change anything because we're talking about a genocide regime. We're talking about a government that could care less about the opening of others. So we are pushing for sanctions, sanctions against Ethiopia and Eritrea. So you can do, you can help us achieve this by putting pressure on your local elective leaders. So it's very important that you talk to your MPs, to your Congress and Senate people, but most importantly, also remember that at the heart of this is a political difference, it's an ideological difference. And let's all remember that people do have the right to be self-governed. Uh, for the people of Tigray, the right to self-governance is very important because it's not something that was gifted to us. It's something that was blood and flesh. Ethiopia has had so many civil wars previously and at the heart of it has always been ethnic groups demand and right self-determination. So in all of the advocacy you do, remember you're, you're, you're fighting for people who want to be administered by their own elected officials, who want to have the right to speak their own language, to exercise their unique and beautiful culture. So this is what you're fighting for. And you should find strength in knowing that every tweet that you send out will make a difference on the lives of innocent lives that are perishing in the dark. I just wanted to at this thank you i guess oh okay i, I can continue um um with coffee and um the sanctions that maza um mentioned what is going to have the most impact is going to be the economic uh, side of it so as someone who is within the coffee industry see where your money is going um if uh, you know, so much of it comes from Ethiopia, how much of it is the government using, how much of the, that money is going back and actually causing issues on the farmers, how, what portion of that money actually goes directly to the farmers who live on the money um, that you are generating for them. That is a big um, aspect of it as one, as on a business scale, that one, I mean, you would have the biggest impact um, as individuals, education is definitely one of them. Um, for instance, uh, with Ola, which is um, the organization that I am a part of, I always remember the, the co-founder telling me, um, without advocacy, there is no development. Without stability within that country, things like education, youth, women and girls, stuff like that are just, it, it's going to be one, it's not going to be happen. It wouldn't happen. And um, two, without having stability and the government taking all of the money and all of that stuff, we just, we don't have anything. So it always starts with advocacy, uh, with a stable government. Um, I think, yeah, that, that's my major uh, advice. 
Thank you, ladies, so much for, for being here today and for giving us the opportunity to highlight and amplify your voices and your stories of um, not only the trauma and the pain, but also the victories and the, the wins and the spirit of the people. So I'm really looking forward to that. And hopefully everyone um, on the call heard about some of these tangible things that we can be doing um, in terms of raising awareness, um, calling our elected officials, letting them know that we need to get them to support an unhindered humanitarian effort um, and give them access, push the UN in terms of um, investigations, pushing for sanctions, and understand that we may be one person, but we have a voice as well. So using all of our platforms, um, whether it's social media, whether um, we can share this with our friends, I think it is really important to, to note that we can all make a difference individually that will have a ripple effect and will help the people that are on the ground as well. And I really like what you said, Ayansi, that without advocacy, there is no development. And advocacy is from the people. It's from the people who see that there is something wrong and are speaking up about it. So again, I just want to thank you all for sharing your stories today, for being here, being honest and vulnerable. I know it's not easy um, being in this um, environment, um, but I do want to honor all three of you and for the women who we do not know their names, the women and girls of whom we do not know, um, uh, we want to make sure that we're honoring them as well. So thank you. Um, and then for anyone who's on the call right now, I just wanna let you know that um, we will not stop talking about this um, as, as Debbie La Cafe and as individuals, we will keep talking about this and other um, humanitarian crises and other ways that we can impact the world. So whatever we're seeing, whether it's in Haiti or uh, Nicaragua, in the US, um, Europe, Asia, whatever it is that we can be doing, we'll be sure to highlight those. Um, so please make sure that you're tuned in and you're signed up for our newsletters. Um, follow us on all of our social platforms. And we are looking forward to having another webinar just like this in mid-April. So just make sure that you're tuned in so you can get that information. Um, ladies, any other places where people can follow you or they can get other information? I put the Omna Tigray handle in there, but if there's anywhere else. I just added the Ola Oromo as well. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the biggest things we focus on is that a lot of information goes in uh, within the Oromo community is just insular. Um, so a lot of translating and getting data, a lot of articles and uh, talking with journalists just to amplify our voices is something that we work on. But on our website, ola.org, you can find all of these stories, especially stories of individuals who are um, facing these, who are, who are dying at the hands of um, the government forces. Yeah, the same thing with uh, Omran Tigray as well. We also have um, an article section where we focus on just some of the stories as well. I think the stories are the most powerful. You know, Absolutely. you hear all the numbers all the time, but the stories are really what connect you to what's happening on the ground to the people. Um, so, you know, omnatigai.org also for, for any resources. And the other thing too, is just, I'd also just highly encourage, you know, back to that education piece, just looking in, you know, online and seeing what's happening, um, seeing all the, um, and looking at it from like, you know, specific independent media agencies. So like, if you think about like CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, all those um, are pretty credible. And um, the other thing too is, you know, something that I always like to do is just to like calibrate. So kind of looking at these different news sources and just recognizing and seeing um, that if there are multiple people sharing something that's happening, it, the numbers may differ, right? Like we may know that some people say 50,000, some people say 60,000, et cetera. But I think um, the other thing too, is just, we know directionally that this is moving in a very bad direction and uh, we want to make sure that there's some sort of change that happens. So, you know, calibrate, you know, when it comes to education, just learn more online. There's a lot of different sources, a lot of news sources that are now um, talking about this. And there's solely some independent media agencies that are also entering the region. So just keep up to date with all of that. Melza, any other last words in terms of what, um, where people can uh, follow you, follow the movement and continue these conversations? 
Yeah, just in addition to Omna Tigray, uh, make sure that you also follow, you know, different UN agencies and different international aid workers, because uh, particularly the UN and also the borders without uh, doctors without borders, they're on the ground and from time to time they they do um, give us a report what about seeing what's happening in Tigray. So it's also important to, pick, try, to, to keep following those, uh, but also try to follow Tagaro activists, Tigran activists, so that you can hear firsthand from them about what's happening on the ground. And particularly with Omna Tigray, it kind of gives you a comprehensive organization that you can support financially. Do there is a where you can find, you know, pre-made tweets and slide decks that are very, um, you know, informational and depend based on that information, you can go ahead and do with that part of the movement, part of the effort, uh, you know, trying to save innocent lives and together for letting us, you know, talk about what's happening to our people, to our family members back home. We do really appreciate it and we look forward to, you know, further engagement going forward. Thank you so much for taking Thank you for everything. We're grateful. Thank you. And you all are getting amazing praise in the chat. Just make sure you take a moment to, to read that as well. Um, Bishat said earlier that this movement is being led by women and girls, and you see them here today. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for taking your time out, um, for leading this movement, for, for giving us hope, and for showing us that there's a way out. So with that, Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you at our upcoming webinar in April. And please stay connected through all of us, through our social media, through all of our mediums. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.